crypto. Our next guest says, says there's an even bigger catalyst on the horizon that could bring about a crypto comeback. You at home. Bart Smith is a head of digital assets at Susquehanna, but he here is known as Wall Street's crypto king. <laughs> Hope you like your nickname. <laughs> great, so. great to have you back. Um, so retail investors in the form of what and what sort of comeback do you think uh, they're going to make? Well, so the narrative has been about this institutional wall of money. And in Treason Horowitz, it, it's, it's $300 million. It's a great story. But they're, they're venture capitalists. Like they're fintech venture capitalists at that. And so I don't feel like that's a tremendous departure from what they've done if it was a a big asset manager or like a, a brand name uh, hedge fund that probably would have more catalysts in the space. Um, and when you talk to those folks, you don't really get that first mover sense of urgency. Uh, I think an area of the marketplace that hasn't been touched upon as much is Secretary Hinman, or, um, uh, Hinman from the SEC two weeks ago when he talked about uh, the Ether no longer being a security and kind of stating why, it, it left out that, well, a lot of these other tokens don't meet those criteria. So are they going to be securities? And if so, are they going to need to be on broker-dealers? And so that, that's an interesting uh, part of the market. And, and frankly, where you have seen demand is from retail people in the U.S., Coinbase, Gemini, Circle. All of, those, uh, all of those people are servicing retail investors. So we're thinking, I mean, when we think about retail investors, we're thinking about the guy at home. And it may include the guy at home. But we're also talking about sort of high net worth individuals who may be going through their RIAs, so they have more capital uh, to expend. Why do you think they are now going to get in? Are they the same people who are in at the height or are these different people? Well, there's, you know, there's over 600,000 registered reps in the United States, and the vast majority of them are not able to advise their their, their clients to buy Bitcoin. And so as the regulatory clarity kind of opens up and, and all of a sudden you're seeing, you know what, there, there's an opportunity for uh, some of the firms out there. So at the bottom end of the spectrum, you have kind of the, the disruptor, right, like the Robin Hood, who now offers to their 4 million mostly millennial customers Ether and Bitcoin. And then at the, kind of the top of the food chain, you know, you have uh, Abigail at, 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 um, Fidelity. at Fidelity, and they're building out, you know, a, a, a crypto platform there. And so in between, you have all these other players who, where there is a, a real kind of sense of urgency for an, an asset grab. So, Bart, we're sitting here in the U.S. We get very focused on the U.S., but crypto is a global asset. Yeah. More than 50 percent of the volume traded is in Asia. I'm starting to see a lot of Asian family offices, high net worth investors come in and buy this market. Is that more of a catalyst, perhaps, than the, the U.S. retail investor? It is. Or, I mean, in general, you see, you've seen this in the past where the RIA market has led institutional, right? And that's what happened in the ETF world. In, in the early stages of, of, of ETFs kind of coming to market in the early 2000s, you know, institutions called them a fad and dangerous, you know, that they were inefficient. And so and what, what the RIA marketplace did is they took these, these tools and used them to build por portfolios. And as they gathered assets and they started doing institutional-sized trades, that ended up being kind of the case study for larger institutions like pensions and endowments, insurance companies using ETFs. Mm -hmm. I think in this space you could see the same thing, where you see large pools of retail non-institutional assets, but family offices kind of act like small institutions. And so I think that might be a proving ground where you see once again, kind of the lower end of institutional leading larger. In terms of institutional demand, what have you seen? What did you see as Bitcoin tested its year's lows? So, again, again I think that the, the, the institutional world is looking at this, but there doesn't feel like there's this, I got to move now, right? If you look at most of the people who manage hedge funds in the crypto space, for the most part, they're not people like you. They're not, they're not capital markets people. They're engineers. They're computer scientists. They don't, haven't really managed people's assets before. And I think that they feel like in, in, the, in the hedge fund world and the big asset management world, I can move. I could grab one of these funds and, or I could launch my own and I would have a very competitive advantage given the fact that I already have institutional customers. Mm -hmm. The smaller hedge funds who are in the space, they don't, they don't have those institutional customers to call on. All right. Mark, great to have you with us. Thank you.